Well, good morning, Parkway Church. It is good to be together everywhere we're gathered, whether we are at Parkway Victoria, Lone Tree, Port Lavaca, Quero, everybody worshiping online. It's good to be together because we all need a church family, people to do life with, people to worship with, people to serve with, people to go through challenging seasons of life with. We all need family. And I'm so glad that you're a part of the Parkway family today. If we haven't met yet, my name is Mike, and it is my privilege to lead and to love this church family and to open God's word with you today. We're in the midst of a series where we're learning together from Romans chapter 8. Many people call this the victory chapter of the Bible. It's where we see who we are in Christ and the difference he has made, is making, and will make in our life. So far in this series, we've discovered that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of God's grace, my past is forgiven, my future is secure, and my present has a purpose, to live, to glorify him, and to love him. And then we've learned also that because we are no longer condemned, we're completely forgiven in Christ, 100% justified by our faith. Because of who we are in Christ, we now live with a new obligation to please the Lord. We're no longer slaves to our flesh, the sin nature of our past. Instead, we are now to keep in step with the Spirit, to love and please and honor God in every area of our life, to set our mind on things above, to set our heart's affections on the will of the Lord. And we learned last week that this is only possible because of our relationship with God. That in Christ, when we put our faith in him, we are adopted as sons and daughters. We are 100% his for all of eternity. And because we're 100% his, we can live walking with him no matter what the day brings. And that is such good news because today we're going to deal with the difficult days in life. Today we're going to deal with the reality that you and I live in a world that's broken and marred by sin, and you and I live lives that include struggle and include suffering. We're gonna see that you and I, no matter our struggle, no matter what we are suffering with or through, we can live with hope because we have a living hope in Jesus. And if you think about it, you can't live without hope. You ever scroll on social media and you come across those memes? that have pictures of food, and you say, which one of these food could you live without? It's got pizza, hamburgers, tacos, steak. Like, which one of those could you give up? I don't think I could give up any of those. Those are the four essential food groups in my world. I wish it was easy. I wish it would be pizza, tacos, steak, Brussels sprouts. Because I would give up Brussels sprouts gladly for the rest of my life easy decision. I can live without those. But you know what you can't live without? If hope was listed in one of those quadrants, you could never ever give up hope. Because when you lose hope, you lose everything. There's a quote from Hal Lindsey that speaks to this. It says, man can live about 40 days without food. That would be a challenge. But you know who did that? Jesus did it. And others have done it on hunger fasts. Man can live about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only one second without hope. Because when you lose hope, you lose everything. And so today I wanna to talk to those who are here and struggling. I wanna to talk to those who are gathered online and they are attempting to put their hope in Christ by joining in worship today and learning from his word. I wanna to talk to those of you who are struggling or suffering right now because we can have hope in Christ that actually makes a difference to our lives. I also wanna to talk to those who aren't struggling or suffering right now to help you prepare for your season of suffering, your season of struggle. You're like, Mike, you are a ray of sunshine today. I'm either struggling now or I will be struggling in the future. I'm either suffering now or I will be suffering in the future. Well, friends, that's true because of the broken world that we live in. But as we look at Romans 8, verse 18 today, Paul draws a stark contrast 
between the broken world we live in today and the perfect world that Christ holds for us in glory. Read it. Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What Paul says as he opens this section of Romans chapter 8, is you might think right now things can't get any worse. You might think right now you are at your rock bottom. You are in a season that will never, ever get worse. And he says, I want to change your attention from your present sufferings to your future glory. Because you might be in a place right now where you say it can't get any worse. And God's word promises you one day it can't get any better because you will know and experience the glory of God. You may be in a season right now where you say it can't get worse, but there's coming a day when it can't get any better because you're experiencing the glory of the promise of God. And so friends, today I want to encourage you that if you're in a season of struggle, or you're watching someone you love suffer. I remember when my mom died of Alzheimer's dementia. It was a long battle. I remember the day she forgot my name. That was really hard when your mom couldn't remember who you were. The only time that I liked that she forgot my name is one time when she thought I was my brother, and she told me I looked skinny. So I liked that. It was hard watching her dwindle away. It was hard watching her when she stopped eating and sitting by her bedside and watching. She was never a large woman. She was only 4'11 and a half at her tallest. But as the disease took hold, she got smaller and smaller and tiny laying in that bed just before she passed away. And I remember that struggle and suffering that she was going through. But I knew also whom she put her hope in. That's Jesus. I remember who is faithful to his promise. That's Jesus. I was doing everything I could. My brother was doing everything he could. My sister was doing everything he could. My sister-in-law and Christy and all of our family were doing everything they could to care for her. But there's one day when our care would come to an end and she would be cared for by the Savior who died for her and gave her life. She would be cared for by our Father in heaven. You see, the present sufferings of today are nothing compared to the future glory we have in Christ. You may say today, Mike, I don't know how I'm going to get through today. I say, lift your head and see the future the Lord has for you. And some would say, Mike, I've got a theological question about this suffering. Because if we have a God who is sovereign, which means he's overall in charge of all, God can do anything he desires to do then why is there suffering in the world? If we have a good, sovereign God, then why is there suffering? In fact, some people use this as an excuse not to put their faith in Jesus. They ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And Jesus answers that on one level. He says, who is good? None of you are good. There's only one good man or one good woman that walked this planet. And that good man, his name is Jesus. The rest of us are broken, sinful people. So when we ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people, we're putting ourselves in the wrong category. That's a reality, friends. When we ask the question, how can a good, all-powerful, all-sovereign God allow suffering to happen, know this. If God wasn't good, and God wasn't sovereign, and God wasn't active in our world, our suffering would be so much more. Our suffering physically would be multiplied. Our suffering emotionally would be multiplied. Our suffering spiritually would be exponentially worse than it is today if God wasn't good and if God wasn't active in our world. See, the hand of God suppresses some of the suffering that the sin of man has earned. The hand of God gives general grace to his people and to the world, suppressing some of the suffering that our sin has earned. Friends, if we didn't have a good God who was involved in the world, this world would be a much worse place. The other thing we know, if God is good and God is sovereign, 
he sets the limits to our suffering. There are times when we suffer and we struggle, and in God's providence and his perfect timing and his divine will, he ends our suffering with a healing here on earth. There are also times when we must look beyond today and see the future glory that he holds because for some of us and for those that we love, the healing doesn't come here on earth, but the healing comes with Jesus in heaven. And we say, even on those days, our God is good. Even on those days, our God is sovereign. Even on those days, our God is in charge because without his grace, our world would be so much worse. And without his activity in our lives, we would not have any hope to hold on to. But because God is good, and because he does good even for bad people, and because God's in charge and limits the suffering, both in its, its extremity and then also in its timing, because God is good, we can trust him. See, there's something that happens when Christians suffer. We begin to be more like Jesus when we suffer right. Because we know that Jesus went to the cross, died in our place, suffering. We know that Jesus was beaten and bruised. We know that Jesus shed his blood, suffering. And yet we know that Jesus was also raised again from the dead, alive. Because we have a living Savior, we can have a living hope. And so when you and I suffer, Maybe our prayer needs to be, God, I trust your timing. Do your work. God, I trust your timing. Don't waste this hurt. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, listen to what the Bible says about how God uses our hurts and our sufferings. Paul wrote, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says in Philippians 3, 10 and 11, that somehow, some way, when we suffer, when we are weak in this world, when we're weak in this world emotionally, physically, spiritually, it's then that we know that his grace is sufficient and his grace is becomes our strength. When you and I suffer in this world, we become like Jesus. And yes, we know the pain that sin brings, but friends, we also know the victory that comes with life in Christ because Jesus suffered to the point of death, but he rose again, our living savior. You have a living hope because you follow a living Savior. That might have been a great place for you to say amen. So I'm going to try that one more time. You have a living hope because you follow a living Savior. Hey, that's so good of y'all. As we continue in Romans chapter 8, we learn that not only do we wait on the Lord, but even creation waits on the Lord. Not only were we broken by our sinfulness, but creation was broken and marred by man's and woman's sinfulness. Romans 8, 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Friends, there is coming a day when Jesus will return, when he will judge the world for their sin, and when our world will be recreated. There's coming a day when all the wrongs will be made right. There's coming a day when the old will be made new. There's coming a day when our hope will be seen. And here we see in Romans chapter 8 that even creation waits and longs for that day. Keep reading verses 20 and 22. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Paul teaches us something here about the condition of our world. He says, not only do we look for the day when our hope will be made known here and now, but even creation 
waits and longs with eager expectation. That phrase, eager expectation, used twice in this passage. And the picture is, you're craning your neck to see, is it coming yet? You're craning your neck to see, is it happening yet? You're eagerly expecting. What is it that creation is eagerly expecting? It's liberation. Because even creation has been frustrated by our sin. See it, friends. When we hear of earthquakes in West Texas, pains a childbirth. When we see the intensifying of storms, pains of childbirth. When we see the brokenness of this world as it fleshes out in the decay and loss in our climate, when we see the brokenness in this world as it expresses itself even in destruction around us, we know that that's a reminder that one day every wrong will be made right. One day the liberating king returns. And he doesn't return just for his people. He returns to liberate his creation. There's coming a day when you and I will know in full what we now know of in part. There's coming a day when we will know that our hope is secure in Christ. Keep reading Romans 8, 23 through 25. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we don't have yet, we wait for it patiently. Paul says, first, creation groans for its liberation. Second, man groans for our redemption. You and I know that we live in a broken world and our bodies are subject to the same brokenness. Our bodies are subject today to things that we will not be subject to when Jesus returns or we go to be with him. We groan today because the Spirit of God is in us. We groan today because we still live in bodies that break down. We groan today because we have bodies that betray us and even bodies that might tempt us to sin. We groan today, but we do so with the patient hope that says, today, even with all of its challenges, sins, and struggles, it's not the end of the story. Friends, as you struggle in life, and we all struggle at some point, to some depth, for some time, don't give up your hope and think, this is all there is. Because we wait with eager expectation. We wait patiently, expecting the Lord to move and work just as he promised. Don't give up your hope simply because life is hard. Life being hard is a part of God's redemption process in you and in me. Because somehow, some way, when life is hard and we hold on to the strength of the gospel, we hold on to Jesus as our Savior, we hold on to the Spirit who lives in us and keep in step with Him. Somehow, some way, that struggle makes us more and more like Jesus. Don't give up your hope. I've seen Christians think, I've got everything I'll always get, and if this is as good as it gets, I'm just going to throw in the towel on my faith and live for myself and do what I want to do. If a part of walking with Jesus means I suffer, then I'm going to disengage from that relationship and I'm going to do what pleases me. Well, friends, no. There is no solution to our sin problem and no solution to our suffering that living for yourself can solve. You will only multiply your problems if you choose to live for yourself and to self-medicate and to do what feels good in the midst of suffering and struggling in our world. And friends, we look at this and we know that there is more to come. And Paul tells us here, don't live as though today is all that it is. Yes, you have hope in Christ today, but there's so much more to hope in. He said, we hope in what's yet to come, the redemption of our bodies. 
We hope in what's yet to come, the return of our Savior. We hope in what's yet to come, the day that our bodies are no longer doomed to decay. The day that our world is fair and right and just. We look forward to the day when you and I are betrayed no more. We look forward to the day when the sinfulness of our flesh will be done away with one last time. We look forward to the day because today isn't the end of the story. We wait for what we know is going to come. We do this as we live our lives, friends. We do it like today. Maybe you don't know it, but today, they say, is the first day of fall. Does it feel like the first day of fall in South Texas? Are we wearing flannels? Are we drinking uh, pumpkin spice lattes? Are we hunting without sweating? No, of course not. We are still waiting for fall, but know this. We don't give up on the fact that fall is coming. We don't give up because we know it's coming. The seasons will change. And so we don't give up. In your faith, friends, the seasons will change. And it's by the hand of God and the timing of God. Don't lose hope. Let's keep reading Romans 8, 26 through 27, because watch this. When we are prone to lose hope, tempted to lose hope, think we might lose hope, the Spirit of God steps up and ministers to us powerfully. Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So do you see it? Creation groans for liberation. Man groans for redemption. And the Spirit of God groans, interceding on our behalf. Is it this amazing? I can have hope because even when I don't know what to pray, the Spirit of God who indwells me is praying perfect prayers for me. I don't have to lose hope because even when I don't know what to pray, the Spirit of God is groaning and calling out to God to, from the depths of my body and my soul and my mind. The Spirit is at work. It's one of the reminders that there are times we don't know what to pray. We're not even sure God's working, but even when we don't see it, we know that he's working. Even when we don't feel it, we know that he's working because the Spirit of God lives in every believer in Jesus. And so today, I want to encourage you that if you feel like you're losing hope, hold on to the hope that Jesus provides. The Spirit confirms you're his kid. The Spirit prays for you so that you'll live with hopelessness. And friends, God's hand is on your life. God is working. Next week, I'll unpack this much further, but we know if we keep reading in Romans chapter 8, that Romans 8, 28 says that God works together all things for the good of those who love him and have been called according to, the, to his purpose. Friends, we know that our God is not only sovereign and that he limits our suffering, and our God is not only sovereign that he sets the end dates of our suffering, but our God is so sovereign that he even works all of these things, even things that feel bad to us in the moment. He works all of these things together for our good if we love him and are called according to his purpose. So today I encourage you, to hold on to hope. And as you do so, together we're gonna take communion today as a reminder of in whom our hope is placed. If you came in today to our campuses and you didn't get elements on your way in, if you would raise your hand, our teammates would be happy to get you elements as we prepare for this moment. But we in this moment hold the reminder that we can have hope because of what Jesus did for us, and we can live with hope because we have a living Savior. 
As we prepare for communion, I'm going to take a moment and we're going to pray. And I'm going to give you as believers time. If you need to confess some sin to God, do business with him. If you have made decisions in the past that you're not walking in, double down on your commitment to him as you pray. Prepare for this moment as you come to the table with Jesus and his church and we take communion together. If you've gathered with us on campus or online and you're not a believer in Jesus yet, I want to encourage you to watch worshipers worship. Because this is not an empty act of religion. This is a declaration of faith. This is a statement of what we believe. It's a statement that says, I believe one man died so that every man, woman, and child could live. And I believe that one day he's returning again to get his people and to gather his church. And we will share this with him in eternity. If you have joined us today and you're not a believer yet, watch worshipers worship. But can I also encourage you to consider, is today your day to put your faith in Christ and to find life in him? As we consider that, let's pray together to prepare for this moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are and what you've called us to do to live with hope. And we thank you that you are alive and so our hope can live no matter what we are living through. And God, I pray in this moment that you would prepare us to take communion. God, may we as believers confess our sin to you and experience the restoration of fellowship and experience the cleansing of confession. God, I pray that we would also commit ourselves fully to you, that we would live our lives submitted to you. God, if there's a commitment we need to keep, Lord, may you remind us and convict us and call us to that. As the church prays, if you've gathered with us and today is your day to believe, you've learned that you're a sinner who needs a savior and only Jesus is the savior. You say, yes, I believe that. And let's mark that moment of your faith with a simple prayer you can pray so that you never forget the day that you became a new creation, the day that you became God's child, the day that you were adopted into the family, the day that says, you will live forever with him in heaven. If today was your day, you can pray, Jesus, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a savior and that you are the savior of the world. Thank you for coming for me, for dying in my place and being raised again from the dead. Today, I believe. Thank you for giving me life. Father, we thank you for how you're moving and working in our church. Continue to encourage us and strengthen us and give us hope as we take communion together now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the church does a couple of things to show our faith. One of those is baptism, and we'll be doing that next week. The other is communion. We show what we believe through these simple elements. We open the top and we remove the wafer is a reminder that Jesus' body was broken so that ours never will be. He substituted, he became our substitute on the cross, taking our sin, taking our shame, taking the very scorn of God, friends. The body of Christ was broken for you and for me. And we open that cup as a reminder that there's only one thing that can make us right with God. You can't good your way to God. You can't earn your way to God. You can only faith your way to a relationship with God. It's because by the blood of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. By the blood of Jesus, once and for all, our sins are covered and we are made his kids. The blood of Christ shed for your sins. Father, we thank you for this moment where we can taste and see just how good you are. Help us to walk with you and trust you, to put our hope in you, to have a sure confidence because our confidence is in the one who died for us and was raised again. And Lord, as he prepares to come again and you prepare the timing of that precise moment, 
May we watch what's happening in the world and eagerly expect the return of Christ. May we watch what's happening in the world and eagerly expect Christ to come again. May we live for him, sharing him, being ever devoted to him. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, gang, as we continue in worship, we're gonna step into our time of response. We're gonna give to the Lord using our website and our app and the boxes in the back. Church family, thank you so much for your generosity and the partnership we have in the gospel. As we give, if you need to mark a moment of prayer, you can do so where you are seated or standing or you can come down front in your worship space. In this time, we're gonna sing a song that reminds us that God is our way maker. He's always working. He's always working for our good and his glory. So commit yourself to him and his purposes. Express your love to him as we stand together now. Wherever you're worshiping, let's stand and let's respond to him.